Well, thank you for the introduction first. Um, so, I wanted to talk about microarchitectural attacks, and uh, probably I will uh, show a few to, to you uh, during this uh, talk. But I also thought like it, this should be a keynote, so I should have some some message that I give to you, and it should be more high level, so I should only touch the surface. And I thought like, nah, that's not me. I will go deep down to the technical details, and we will uh, look at interesting problems. Um, so. I would still have a message, and the message will be something maybe along the lines of um, hardware is the new software, right? Think about a conversation between some software engineers in the early 90s, and then they talk about this problem of software bugs that is like becoming more and more of a problem, and they are like, yeah, but with all these new techniques, maybe with formal verification, with static analysis at some later point in the discussion uh, a few years on, um, maybe we will uh, get hold of this problem, and then we don't have to worry about software bugs anymore. It even sounds ridiculous as I say it, right? But if we think about hardware problems, like Meltdown, Spectre, yeah, they will add formal verification, and then these problems will disappear in the future. Like, no, that's not how we write hardware. We write hardware the same as software in editors on a computer, just like software. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, I probably want to talk a bit about my attacks and, and the, the ideas that we had there. And many of those are really nice ideas, I would say. Um, but uh, some of them also weren't. Like, for instance, this, uh, we made these t-shirts and run around at conferences with them. And actually, it's, it's a really, they really have a, a very uh, fundamental flaw. Uh, I several times experienced that at conferences, people would ask me, like, uh, what does the code on your back say? And like, I, I can't see it. I can't explain you line by line what it does because I can't see it. So we are not usability experts. <laughs> um, maybe we could use one, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, so the attacks. Uh, we, we like to have fun at work. The most important thing in life is having, having fun, enjoying life, and that also goes for work. So when we worked on a prime and probe cache attack, uh, in the Amazon cloud, we thought like, well, Prime and Probe is already a name that exists, and Amazon Prime is already something that exists. Well, let's just combine, combine that, then we have Amazon Prime and Probe. We will see that later on today. Or you probably know AngularJS, and that's like, um, it says something like rich features for the web or something, um, with the slogan underneath. We changed it into RowHammerJS, root privileges for web apps, uh, which is also nice. I mean, who doesn't want to have root privileges in a JavaScript app? Um, or uh, fantastic timers and where to find them. There we found uh, high, resolution, high resolution timers in JavaScript for microarchitectural attacks. And a nice thing about this one was, uh, <laughs> this guy already holds a clock, so it's already about timers. Um, or we tried to mitigate uh, JavaScript-based uh, microarchitectural attacks or side-channel attacks, and we call it JavaScript zero. It's more like a healthier variant of JavaScript, all right, with all the things that are dangerous. So we are talking about side channel attacks here. So what is a side channel attack? Um, you probably know this from, the, from maybe from old movies uh, where someone with a stethoscope listens to the clicking noises of the safe. And when the latch snaps in, you know that you have to turn the wheel the other direction. So uh, by that, you can um, crack the combination of the, code, uh, of, the, of the safe. So this is a side channel attack because the safe doesn't directly tell you what the secret combination is. Unlike, uh, think about something like Heartbleed. In Heartbleed, you directly get data uh, through some vulnerability. That's not a side channel attack. But this is a side channel attack because this noise is just meta information that the safe, by the way it is manufactured, by design, produces. We can't avoid it somehow. Or we can, we can make it more difficult for the attacker, but we can't avoid it. So, my definition for side channel attacks is um, obtaining metadata. So the obtaining part is important, the metadata part is important, and then deriving data from it, or deriving secret data, secrets from it. So let's make a quick check. Uh, if I profile cache utilization with performance counters, um, who thinks that's a side channel? 
Okay, I would say it's not a side channel because I just profile cache utilization, right? I, that's what I want to do. But if I profile cache utilization or observe cache utilization with performance counters and use it to infer a crypto key, does it become a side channel attack? Yes, then it becomes a side channel attack. So this inference step is an important part of side channel attacks. Usually, uh, if you directly get the entire key without having any inference step, then it, we don't consider this a side channel attack. Um, same for measuring memory access latency with flush and reload. I mean, flush and reload is described as a side channel attack. So is this already a side channel attack if I measure the memory access latency? Who thinks it's a side channel attack? Oh, no, basically no one. Uh, but if I use it to um, infer keystroke timings or inter-keystroke timings, does it become a side channel attack? Yes. Okay, great. So we all agree uh, on this terminology. Uh, but then there's Intel. Uh, and they had this manual, and maybe by now they also have a different opinion on that, but maybe not. Um, but they have this manual or white paper where they say internal analysis of speculative execution side channels. Now, the question is, what is that? Speculative execution side channels. We have side channels. We know side channels, right? So these are traditional cache attacks, maybe uh, power side channel attacks, EM attacks. We know a lot of different side channels. Uh, most of the time that I'm working in this area, I'm focusing on cache attacks, maybe on crypto keys, maybe on keystrokes. Um, so this is usually this, what I described, you infer something from metadata. And then there's misspeculation, like specter type attacks, where you have a branch misprediction, you speculate the wrong way, and you leak data because the program does something it shouldn't do. And then we have lazy exception handling like attacks like meltdown, foreshadow, zombie load, uh, there the processor already knows I'm now going to do something that, is, that does not make any sense for me. Like I'm, I'm just trying to clear the pipeline as fast as possible, so the processor switches in this mode where anything is fine, right? So it switches in this mode, it knows that this is not uh, something useful to do now, to access these memory locations, because it already knows that it should fault. So let's give these a better name. Misspeculation is a long word. Lazy exception handling, even worse. Let's just call them meltdown type attacks and specter type attacks, uh, because that is basically uh, what they are. And then also, let's avoid the term speculative side channel attacks. And I attended an Intel event earlier this year, and I there, uh, there also had this slide and told them, I think it would be better for you to avoid this term, because side channels, those people who are, who are familiar with side channels, for instance, power side channels, are aware that we will never get rid of side channels entirely. As long as you have some difference in what uh, the algorithm or the specific implementation does in one or the other case, even if you just have two wires for two cases, you can measure the difference at some point. Uh, so we will never get rid of this bubble, but we can get rid of this bubble entirely. Throwing this all together leaves a very unclear message to the customers what you will be able to mitigate and what you won't be able to mitigate. So maybe let's talk about mitigations against uh, these attacks, but we only do that after we understood them, and for that we first have to understand how they work. And there's one thing that I, uh, that I like to talk about a lot because I enjoy it a lot. Um, it's, uh, of course, it's uh, food, right? Who, I mean, who doesn't like food? Uh, so, um, Cooking. I'm not very good at cooking, uh, but I, it's necessary to get something that is tasty, right? Um, and when I cook, I have to follow a recipe. And usually you have all the ingredients, and I set them all on the table so that I can check which ingredients are there. And usually what I see is, oh, one thing is missing. Uh, that's unfortunate, so I can't start cooking, so I have to go to the grocery store, and then I uh, get the ingredient there, then I go back and I realize, oh no, there's something else missing. Yeah? And then I go to the grocery store again. That happens to me something like five to seven times, and then I have all the ingredients at home. Yeah. And I, I came up with a very clever idea. I, I would argue that this is something you haven't seen before. It's, it's completely ingenious. Um, it's a device that allows you to store food. I call it a food cache. And it's, it's really great. So whenever you go to the grocery store, you can store food in there, 
and retrieve it from there without going to the grocery store and save a lot of time. And I told that to my office colleagues, and they were like, seriously? This already exists in processors since 30 years? We call it a CPU cache, and the CPU does exactly that. Whenever you access some memory location, uh, it, it will first have a cache miss, so it will be slow because it has to go to the DRAM, like the grocery store, so it has to uh, wait for the response, and then the data is there, it's stored in the cache, and then you can continue. So this takes a long time, but the second time you access it, it's fast because it's already there. Okay, so the first time slow because of the DRAM access, second time is fast because of um, the cache. And that's already interesting. Now we have a timing difference, right? And we just said if we have some difference, if it, even if it's just two wires, then we have a side channel. So in this case, this is already clear that we must have a side channel here. And the side channel attack works like this. Um, we explained flush and reload now. And here we have some shared memory. Shared memory is shared in the processor cache. So if we have an attacker process and a victim process, they might share some memory, a shared library maybe. And if it's cached for one of them, it's cached for the other as well because shared memory is shared in the cache. Um, and if the attacker now flushes this memory location, the attacker knows what to expect. The attacker now knows, oh, it shouldn't be in the cache anymore unless the victim accesses exactly that memory location. And then at a later point in time, because I know what I expect, I can measure how long it takes to access this location. And if it's fast, I know the victim accessed this. And if it's slow, I know the victim didn't access this. Oh, that's really nice because uh, that's, a, that's a nice side channel. This is typically a 64-byte region, so I can track what other programs do on a 64-byte granularity. It's not as good as GDB, but it's also not much worse. Um, okay, so uh, the question is, how do we measure this time? So this sounds very easy, right? I simplified a lot of things here. So how does measuring time actually work? Um, and there are different approaches. You can use pseudo-serializing instructions, actual serializing instructions, uh, M fences. You have to use those because modern processors work out of order. So if you don't do that, the processor might reorder all of these instructions. Um, and by doing that, RDTSC or RDTSCP is usually the choice uh, to, to get a cycle, something like a cycle accurate timer. And because it's so complicated to actually measure, um, like, the, the uh, latency of small code snippets. Uh, Intel wrote a white paper, how to benchmark code execution time uh, on Intel IA32 and IA64 instruction set architectures, December 2010. Um, this is really nice because it tells you how to um, do these measurements. Uh, but at the same time, last year you might have seen this headline, Intel publishes microcode security patches, no benchmarking or comparison allowed. But <laughs> that's unfortunate, right? Um, if they have their own white paper. Um, okay, but they later on updated, and this was some, someone being overly eager to avoid having negative uh, press, I guess, uh, about the benchmarks. Okay, so we will do this, benchmarking. So how long does it take if I try to get a cache hit? Uh, well, most of the time, this is a log scale histogram. You can see the CPU cycles here. Most of the time, I'm around 75 cycles for a cache for cache misses, and this is really nice. Even if you have no background in statistics, it will be very easy to put the threshold here and say if it's below this, then it's a hit. If it's above this, then it's a miss. Uh, that's super easy. But you see there are these gaps between the bars, right? And they are in this plot because I plotted it this way. But actually, if you would look at these um, bars on a raw uh, data set, you would see that there are um, cycle numbers which have zero and right, left and right of that, uh, you have very high bars. So what is the reason for that? Because the processor, the RD, RDTC is not actually a cycle counter, it only approximates one. And that means on some systems, um, RDTC can be too inaccurate. Or also on ARM systems, you might not even have an instruction available to user space to do that. And in these cases, we also had a very interesting idea, and I think that is the deepest we go in this presentation. Um, we can build our own timer. Does anyone have an idea how to build a timer? Uh, well, our idea was we start a thread, and the thread continuously increments a global variable. And with that, 
uh, we have a super nice timer, right? <laughs> and uh, the global variable is basically our timestamp. It doesn't give us cycle count, but it allows us to compare the time. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine this is a solution like this, right? And also, I mean, what are our expectations? Do we really think we can do better than the hardware? No, I mean. So on my processor, RDTSC, the RDTSC can only return values uh, in a distance of three. So I could get the result three cycles or six cycles or nine cycles, but nothing in between. So I would say the resolution of RDTSC is three cycles if I do this in a loop. Um, well, if I try to measure the time, if I try to uh, get a timestamp by running this loop in C, who thinks the resolution will be better than with RDTSC? Who thinks it will be worse? Yeah, okay, I think the a majority was for worse, but there was not a strong participation in this vote, yeah. Um, but majority is right, of course. I mean, what were we expecting? Yes, of course, this is slower. But then we learned something in university. If C code is too slow, we write it in assembly. Let's go for assembly. Um, OK, so assembly, we wrote this code. We uh, moved the timestamp uh, variable, the address of the variable, into RCX, and then increment RCX, uh, de like dereference RCX, increment it all the time. And this is an endless loop, jump there. Who thinks it, the resolution will be better than with C? Who thinks the resolution will be better than with RDTSC? Uh, a few more hands than before. And in fact, it is better than C. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> OK, that's not so impressive. But then we thought, well, maybe, we, maybe the assembly code is not optimal, right? It only has two instructions. Two instructions, maybe that's too much or too little. So maybe if we add more instructions, it gets faster, we thought. So what do we do here? We increment a register, and we move the register value to this memory location of the timestamp of the global variable. Who thinks this has a higher resolution than the previous assembly? OK, that's, who thinks it doesn't? Yeah, OK, so majority is for it doesn't. And uh, who thinks it has a higher resolution than RDTSC? Uh, who thinks it doesn't? Whoa! <laughs> how, do, how does that work? Why does that work? Out of order execution. Uh, this instruction doesn't have any dependency on the timestamp. Our previous assembly code had to fetch the value and then increment it and then write it back. This one increments in a register and just writes out to memory all the time. So this is very nice. You can mount cache attacks. This is a cache template attack. We press keystrokes in this editor and run. And then we just at some point stop this and uh, pick any address which has a certain number of hits. Maybe uh, this one. This one looks good. Let's a um, letter that we press here one time. And that is super nice because here we have the uh, inter-keystroke timing, or here we have the inter-keystroke timing, uh, and that can be used to infer the words that we actually typed here. Um, there was a recent attack um, just a published a few days ago, the Netcat attack. Uh, they also look at inter-keystroke timings and by that infer words. But with cache template attacks, you can also just iterate over the address space and try to make uh, a distinction between different letters based on the address. Uh, so here, this is from libgdk, and they do a binary search to translate key codes. And you know in a binary search, there are these leaf nodes, and the leaf nodes, um, they are only accessed if it's exactly that key. For instance, for n, this address. Great. But also, uh, we can do other things with that. For instance, uh, one night we thought uh, it would be a really a great idea to um, pipe uh, generic TCP IP traffic through uh, the uh, cache, through a cache cover channel on the Amazon cloud. So here we will transfer a video from one Amazon EC2 instance to another, which are co-located on the same physical machine. And then we'll uh, show uh, the video in a local uh, VLC client. And they will transmit a video in this case without transmit having any network traffic. You can see it here. So hello from the other side 
Remote shall throw the cash this time To run through your system Steal everything that I want And as much and else covered You'll never know Hello from the outside I don't even need network rights Broke into your machine Your cash noise pattern It clearly Doesn't save your VM Anymore And you can see there is no transmission On the sender side Yes, 0 0.019 megabytes 0 0.099 megabytes this is, There is no transmission happening um, This was all transmitted Through the cache, we didn't have a single error And you can see the uh, transmission rate Through the cache here um, and this, this is all like, yeah, okay, you're laughing, and like, yeah, this is fun, and like, hello from the other side, yeah, that's like, we tried, like, the first word that Michael Schwarz, my co-author on this paper, um, or one of the co-authors on this paper, uh, the first message that he transmitted over the channel was hello, so he received hello from the other side. Um, so, this is all fun, but Anders Fogg on Twitter said, yeah, this is all fun, but imagine how many credit card credentials per second that is, right? It's a nice demo, but it's a bit uh, frightening also. Okay, so let's take a look at something else. I mean, uh, we all like uh, Intel SGX, which allows us to write uh, insecure code and put it in an SGX enclave, and then it's magically protected, right? No, that's not what SGX does, um, but unfortunately, uh, I've heard from, from uh, people from the industry that sometimes that this is uh, the assumption that these PEs give you this property. And if you look through the SGX developer guide, the last chapter is like um, protection from side channel attacks. And like, whew, they thought about it. And then it says, uh, Intel SGX does not provide explicit protection from side channel attacks. It is the Enclave developer's responsibility to address side channel attack concerns. And it, I think it's very clever, right? <laughs> but if you look at the SGX Bitcoin wallets that are out there, uh, for instance, if we look at T-Chain, T-Chain and the paper, they say, we assume the TE guarantees to hold. And you're like, uh-huh, yeah, sounds good so far. And do not consider side channel attacks on the TE. And we're like, yeah, okay, that, that is a problem because we can mount these attacks on SGX. For instance, this one. This is a prime and probe attack on SGX, on a weak RSA implementation. Who can already see the key? Can anyone already see the key? No? Let's, uh, I mean, we are not so good on statistics, right? So let's just add a moving average. Moving average is easy to understand. Moving average, does anyone see the key now? Well, let me add the solution. Here is the key. All the peaks are ones and the valleys are zeros. Very nice. Um, yeah, and then people are like, no, you can't do that. We said it's out of scope. The, att the attackers don't care what is out of scope. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to work. So we want to continue cooking. And something that always goes wrong when I cook following a recipe, because I don't know how, like, who writes these recipes? These must be very mean people. Because usually the last step is something like serve with cooked and peeled potatoes. And I'm like, yeah, you could have told me that in step two, that I should put them on the oven. And then I have to wait for an hour. And the parents-in-law are already in wait waiting in front of the door and like, ah, we are here. Is the food ready? And I'm like, well, no, I forgot the potatoes. What will they think of me, right? So latency is bad, not only for me, um, but also for, for others. And therefore, I came up with a very clever technique. Um, and when I go through a recipe now, I first check all the steps and see which have a dependency and which ones I can parallelize. Right? So I will reorder them. I call it out-of-order cooking. And I proposed this to my colleagues. And again, they said, well, that already exists. Processors do exactly the same. They will reorder what they can reorder. And if there are dependencies, then, well, they run it after each other. And that is already enough to know, like we now know flush and reload, we know out of order execution, now we can build Meltdown. And the first test that we want to run for Meltdown is this. This code doesn't do anything meaningful, right? We dereference the null pointer, and then we access an array location. 
But this is the first check whether out-of-order execution actually works in the way we imagine it to work. So we would expect that these are independent instructions, so this one can already be executed. And we check that, and it works. Yeah, this is just out-of-order execution. This will work on virtually all out-of-order processors. Um, yeah, so this is so far not a problem. But the exception was only thrown afterwards. So the question is, um, can we uh, do actually um, something like this, where we um, dereference a kernel address, copy it into a local variable, or a register in this case, and then use this register value as an index for a second memory access. And then check whether any part of the array is cached. And it turns out we can. And um, yes, the permission check is not fast enough. And that was very scary when I ran this as first on my computer because it spat out a URL, a long URL, and I never visited that website before. I'm sure of that. And it took me some time to figure out where the URL came from, and it was from my ad blocker list. And then I thought, like, okay, if it can leak URLs from my ad blocker list, it can leak anything else in memory just as well. And it's, that's a bit scary, but I mean, by now we have the mitigations, I guess. Um, so what this, does this attack look like? Um, uh, for instance, here, we, if we know the physical address of this password buffer, then we can write uh, live leak the, um, the password. But also, for instance, if uh, you want to attack something like VeraCrypt, which is like the, the follow-up uh, follow project of uh, TrueCrypt, uh, we are trying to attack VeraCrypt now, and uh, the volume is mounted, but we are an unprivileged attacker. And we have a Python script which uh, runs the Meltdown attack first to break KSLR. Then we use uh, Meltdown to search through the process structs, through the task structs, to find all the properties of this process. And then we will use that to infer uh, the uh, physical address of the key, right? We might know the virtual address, but we're not the physical address. Then we read the key from this, physical, from this physical address. Then we decrypt using PyTrueCrypt. And then you can see what is in there. So my colleague Moritz created this. Um, and you can see that, ah, yeah, there's secret files. Hmm? Ah, yeah, his credit card pin. Uh, please don't look at now because it's a, his real credit card pin, right? And the secret video. I'm like, okay, okay. Oh, not, not this one again. No, we already had this. So the countermeasure against Meltdown then is uh, Kaiser. And we saw an obvious connection between Kaiser and Linux. Kaiser is a patch for Linux, and it's basically um, it's an acronym for kernel address isolation to have sidechains efficiently removed. And uh, we also thought it's like, like Linux has something to do with penguins. And Kaiser, I mean, in German, it's the Kaiser penguin is the emperor penguin, the largest penguin. And we thought, like, this is a patch that will make Linux great again, basically. Uh, they didn't like it. They changed it to something boring like KPTI. But the patch still, um, until a very late stage, was called Kaiser. So only very, um, a very short time before it was merged, it was actually renamed to KPTI. So there are still a lot of uh, code lines that went under in the name Kaiser. Um, OK. So what does Kaiser do? Without Kaiser, we have something like a shared memory um, address space between user memory and kernel memory, and upon a context which we just switch to the upper half. Um, with Kaiser, we separate this, so now we have two address spaces, a user address space and a kernel address space, and we have to do one context switch here, and then an additional context switch, an address space switch to the kernel address space. And this then mitigates um, Meltdown. And I always, as an operating system student in my undergraduate studies, I always dreamt of having some feature that makes it into every operating system. And uh, I mean, now I'm there, now uh, Linux uh, has it, Windows has it, and OS X has it. So it's in every computer and people love it, right? I mean, uh, or maybe not that much because of the performance cost, but still, I mean, I, got, I achieved the goal. It's now in every operating system. That was the goal, not that everyone loves it. Right? Um, okay, so this was all about 
Meltdown, but we maybe want to talk about um, Spectre as well. And Meltdown is about me doing something which I shouldn't do. Spectre is about someone else doing something that, I, that they shouldn't do. And um, I, I think we should go back to cooking. And if I don't cook myself, I can let someone else cook. And there is this very nice pizza place uh, close to our university in Graz. And uh, we go there often for lunch. And usually what happens is one person orders a prosciutto pizza, a fungi, and then diavolo, diavolo, diavolo. We don't know why, but the diavolo pizza seems to be very good there. Or we are a weird bunch of people, maybe. Um, anyway, if we call there by telephone and say, we would like to have a table for six, please, for lunch today. And then they are like, ah, yeah, it's those guys again. Uh, no clue what they will eat, but I bet at least three Diavolos. And we observe that the Diavolos always arrive first. And that's suspicious, right? So I think what they are doing is speculative cooking. So you could exploit that if you wouldn't know what we actually usually order. If that would be a secret, you could, of course, call there and say, uh, here's Theo Graz, I would like to have a table for six, please. And they wouldn't recognize that this is a different voice, right? And then they would prepare the pizza, and it's already there. And then you show up, and they're like, the, the, the pizza cook is a, uh, is a privacy conscious one, right? You, so the pizza cook would be like, oh, no, this is not the right person. I don't give you the pizza. But the smell still lingers in the air, and you can smell it. And this is basically what Spectre does. So you have some interface. You control this index here. And you have some data, and it's protected with a bounce check. So best practice, protect things with bounce checks. And then you pass valid indices, and you go into this code, which will leak information. And the processor will learn that um, it should always predict this direction here. And as we pass an invalid index later on, the processor already learned that we are an, a nice person, always passing valid indices, and speculates this way, and leaks the key with that. And that's, of course, unfortunate, but that's uh, how Spectre works. It's a very simple attack, and we actually don't know uh, how to fully solve this problem because we want the processor to learn in this, in this case. This gives us a performance advantage. But uh, it's difficult to, to um, only uh, predict correct, right? You would have to tell the future for that. Um, OK, so there's also Spectre v2, which is a bit different. There, there are lots of different Spectre variants. I'm got just explaining those two as examples. And here I think of an example where I have an indirect call here to a method. And for the bird, it's a different method than for the fish. For the fish, it's swim. For the bird, it's fly. And one of these methods uh, leaks information from a member variable. And the processor, again, will learn uh, based on what uh, object we pass through this interface what it should predict. And then as we pass a fish, the processor will still predict, oh, the fish should fly, so it will leak the data here. And yeah, that's uh, two attacks. But by now, we know that there are a lot more attacks. So we know that uh, there are like uh, this many attacks, uh, all the different Spectre variants, um, different Meltdown variants. By now, there are a few more, because uh, there's zombie load not even on there yet. Um, and then the question, of course, is like, how do we mitigate this? Right? And one of the first mitigation proposals that I heard in January um, 20. Uh, 18 uh, from a journalist was uh, blockchain. <laughs> Can we use the blockchain to mitigate meltdown inspector? No. But also, uh, if you have seen this, this was earlier this year, I think in January, um, there was by the ACM SIGARCH community. So it's not the security community, but the architecture community. And it shows how far apart these communities are. And uh, the article that they published on their website was, let's keep it to ourselves, don't disclose vulnerabilities. <laughs> this is something that the com security community already abandoned maybe 200, 300 years ago, mostly. Yeah, so probably not a good idea. Um, anyway, the real mitigations. This is also a very frustrating picture, because you can see all the empty squares and empty diamonds, empty circles, these are all not uh, complete mitigations. And to have complete mitigation, uh, you have to combine several of these countermeasures. And uh, that's, of course, a problem, because all of these countermeasures cost performance. So for instance, just to mitigate Spectre v2, they would recommend this, these three. But then again, this one also, maybe, in some cases. Um, so 
it costs a lot of performance if you all add that together. Uh, but I mean, uh, who cares about performance, right? It's like the question then also is like how to find the next big thing. People often ask me how to find the next big thing. And I feel a bit like the things that we are doing uh, feel more connected to something like a natural science. We are exploring the field. Uh, it would be like asking Newton, like, how do you find the next natural law? And I'm like, you look for effects and try to understand the effects that you see. But this is a very high level description of what we do. So let me give you an impression of how we actually find the next big thing. And of course, the first thing that you need for, for a vulnerability is a name. So for instance, if I would write a paper about an attack on iPhones or Apple products maybe, I would call it iZombie and then some, some uh, line afterwards. That would be a great attack name, right? Or if you have an attack where you have remote control over a robot and in theory could kill someone, call it Love, Death and Robots. Great, great paper title. Um, and then we saw this one, Zombieland Double Tap. And we were like, yeah, Zombieland sounds really cool. And if you look at the logo, we would also like to pose like this on a poster. Uh, and then we thought, yeah, land doesn't really, I mean, there's kernel land and user land. But um, also, if you just switch two letters here, you get to zombie load attack. So we thought, this is a really cool thing, right? Zombie load. Then we thought, OK, so what would uh, zombie load actually be? And we figured that, ah, yeah, in the Meltdown paper, we wrote that um, the CPU already issued the subsequent instructions. Ah, and then the question is, what happens with loads that are already, uh, already uh, issued? So I entered into Google, Paul Dukers, load operation completed. And then I was looking for patterns by Intel. Uh, and then you see the second result here. If a fault occurs with respect to the load operation, it is marked as valid and completed. So in the case where you know, oh, this is not doing anything useful, the decision you make is, oh, yeah, it's valid and completed. And the rationality behind that is it will be thrown away anyway later on after everyone was already working with it. But architecturally, you won't see it. So if you run under the assumption that you can't see these microarchitectural effects, um, then this makes sense. And then this uh, uh, zombie load brought us to a deeper understanding of the underlying issue. So actually, looking at something like Meltdown and uh, Foreshadow and zombie load is very similar attacks. So you always have one memory access. The memory access is not valid. It accesses an, an address which you cannot access. And then you go to the load data execution port. Um, and then you go to the load buffer. Load buffer entry is actually allocated at the same time as the reorder buffer. And then we thought about what would a load buffer entry look like. We don't know what it looks like, but we imagine that it has to store at least something like the register number where it's stored. The data should be stored. Uh, the offset uh, in, the, in the page, the virtual page number, the physical page number, something like this. Maybe other information, but equivalent uh, information. Uh, that allows you to do the same things. And then you would uh, update these with the address that you have, so the virtual address and also the target register. And then you go check in the store buffer L1, TLB, and in the LFB uh, whether you get the data from somewhere. And the TLB says, oh, yeah, it's uh, present, but it's not user space accessible. So uh, stop everything, mark it as valid and completed. And the data can go to the register. And already. Uh, be used in subsequent instructions. And the same happens for foreshadow VMM. So in this case, we also go through the same path. Um, but this time, we can't check the TLB because there is no TLB entry because foreshadow VMM works with present false. So we have to do a page walk instead. We first do the page walk for the guest, for the virtual machine. And there, the present bit is already not set. Now, the problem is you have to store this physical page number from the guest somewhere if you would continue. And uh, we assume that uh, the guest physical page number is stored just here and already um, passed on for the comparison with the store buffer, L1 data cache, and LFB. And if it matches, well, the data can go to the register. Uh, this is, of course, a bit unfortunate. Yeah, but that's how it is. Um, zombie load, um, there we have, uh, again, a memory access. And you see the, the, the attacker code looks very similar, right? It was even the same instruction in all three cases. But the microarchitectural state is a bit different. So in this case, we ha will have already a problem around here. We don't know exactly where the problem uh, exists, but it's a difficult situation. The load needs to be reissued, and uh, therefore we stop. 
and then right away the processor already knows, okay, I don't even have to update these fields anymore, just mark it valid and complete it. And the, because this is all in the critical pass, some buffers will still be looked up and the data can go to the register. So how did we actually find it? Actually, we, um, we looked at our Meltdown POC. Um, it always worked on non-L1 memory for us. So you, if you look at the Meltdown paper, um, also the co-authors confirmed these experiments, it works on non-L1 memory. And this was in December 2017. And we reported this to Intel and they said, well, we can't reproduce. Um, then we also had a POC where we explicitly marked the memory as uncacheable. And we sent this POC to Intel in March 2018. And then we also sent an update that it's the LFB. I think it was in May 2018. Um, yeah, I think it was in May 2018. Um, then the question is also, what about noise, right? There is noise. Meltdown has noise. And if you have uncacheable, you actually have a lower signal to noise ratio. So this is already suspicious. So that, um, that means something. And uh, the question is noise. We thought a lot about noise uh, on a completely deterministic system. I mean, we built this machine. And this is our new mantra in our group. There is no noise. Noise is just someone else's data. And if you uh, try to do that now, maybe, um, yeah. This is an um, idea that also was uh, pursued in the Riddle paper. We didn't pursue this in our paper, but we later on published this demo uh, where we leaked the root hash with uh, something like um, two bytes per second or something, or one byte per second, um, which is quite nice. And then we have the root hash after a few uh, minutes. Uh, but also, uh, we tried to live leak audio that is played on the system. And this is one demo here. Okay, this is the original, right? This was not leaking yet, but now we will run uh, a player which plays this file and simultaneously leak it with a zombie load attack which directly plays the sound on the, uh, on the sound card. Okay, so this sounds funny, but uh, at the same time, think about this not being just music, but your Skype call, where someone can infer what you're currently talking on the call. Um, then also the question, zombie processes. I've seen this in uh, um, uh, Stefano's talk, but also uh, there were lately uh, others uh, that criticized that, oh, this is fear-mongering, basically, zombie load. But think about it, we, are, we were talking about zombie threats, zombie processes, and zombie objects for a long time. And there also the problem is that the lifetime is not uh, very well constrained. And that's also the problem in zombie load, that we don't kill the load early enough. We have to kill it earlier, stall the pipeline earlier. And that's ex exactly the same mechanism. Therefore, the name zombie load is just the technical reference to what is happening. Also, why are we doing a tech research? Um, so when I was doing my PhD, many people told me, oh, you should work on defenses and like, try to swim to the surface because uh, we need to be better. But then again, we overlooked Meltdown and Spectre for something like 20 years, right? And we, even, we don't even know whether Meltdown and Spectre are the thing that is uh, relevant. Maybe we overlooked the much bigger threat, right? So maybe we should think about what we are actually doing. Um, OK, so the question is, um, what do we learn from it? Um, and I would say we have a new class of software-based attacks. We didn't have this class before. And there are many problems to solve around these micro-architectural attacks, and especially transient execution attacks. It's like we are discovering the, the area of software bugs, and now it's hardware bugs. And we should dedicate more time into identifying problems and not solely into mitigating known problems. And with that, I would like to close and thank you for your attention. So thank you, Daniel. Uh, so I know we are very short in time, but uh, uh, do you have any question? Anyone? with questions, so there is a microphone here and another over there.
Come on, don't be shy. Oh yeah, good. <laughs> I know this is a quite complicated topic, but uh, uh, thank you for the nice talk. And my my question is more on the vision of the the whole thing. And from your talks, it emerges that in some way there is some tension between performance and security. Yes, I would argue that most of the times there is a tension between performance okay, and security. And yeah. You see a point in which we can have both, or I mean, we we can be secure being uh, performant, or you say if you want to be secure, you must be not. So the problem is that security is very difficult to measure. So the question is always what you mean with secure. And uh, I think usually it makes sense to define security by how much does an attacker have to invest to break your security assumptions. And um, I would say that um, we can definitely do better than we currently do. Um, so while keeping our performance up, um, improve the security. Um, we could do that, for instance, we are looking into this area and also a lot of other universities are right now looking into this area of secure caches, which would um, prevent things like prime and probe, like the Amazon prime and probe attack, it wouldn't work anymore. Um, or not in the same way, not with the same performance. Maybe we bring it down to uh, a byte per second. And then, of course, leaking data is much more difficult and the investment that the attacker has to make maybe does not uh, it does not uh, justify uh, mounting this attack anymore. So you, you are looking for a secure enough solution and not for a... Yes, yes. Because I'm from, from former methods. We search for completely secure or correct things, yeah. but I mean, you are looking for almost. Yeah. So the, the problem is that many of these optimizations, uh, the goal of the optimization is to make things faster, but not always, right? The uh, problem is if you could make it always faster, you have a better algorithm. But, uh, or you can increase the clock frequency maybe. Uh, but things like caches try to make it faster for cases that you can't gener generally optimize. You can't make an arbitrarily large cache. So you always have this side channel in there that things can be in the cache or not in the cache, as long as you share a cache. And um, if you don't want to have this side channel, then you have to go to uh, separate devices or separate caches, yeah? Anyone else? Okay, uh, again, thank you, Daniel, for the talk. And um, I'm wondering, uh, I was wondering, I mean, uh, these attacks are particularly nasty because we don't have visibility inside the processor structure, but I mean, why don't the vendor like Intel has done their own analysis and found yeah. this years ago and patched it already? Why do we have to discover it in a black box scenario? Yes, um, thanks for the question. Um, so um, the problem that we are looking at is uh, that um, the complexity of our systems has outgrown uh, the capacity of the human mind, I would argue. Uh, we have lots of engineers who work with, let's say, linear uh, progress on increasing the complexity. But if you put the features of multiple engineers together, it grows more than just linearly. And uh, this is a problem. We can't, uh, we can't keep up with the complexity growth in our systems. Um, and if, if a system is too complex for our minds, it starts becoming something like uh, nature. This, goes, uh, this idea goes uh, back to a book from Herbert Simon from the 70s. Um, and uh, he argued that we have to study these complex systems like nature. Uh, it's like the study uh, or the science of the artificial. And we apply the same methods as in natural sciences. Um, so looking at the source code wouldn't have revealed these, um, these vulnerabilities because you would have had to uh, look at too many things in different places at the same time, and that's just beyond the, the capacity of, of a mind to understand a full processor um, in all its details. Um, maybe there are some very clever people who, who, who can do that, but um, at the same time, you also, to, to find these attacks, and that's the problem that, that I mentioned earlier with the architecture community, um, 
The problem is that you also need the right mindset to look at the problem. So very often when I was uh, speaking with people uh, who are not from the security field, I got responses like, yeah, okay, yeah, now I understand why you can do these attacks, but why would anyone do that? And if, if that's the mindset with which you develop these uh, systems, then of course uh, you, you won't um, find all the attacks that are possible. Thank you. Let's thank uh, the speaker again.